I'm going to introduce Joe Elkema. Joe is from uh, the National Christian Foundation, and Joe's put together a panel of your peers. These are Barnabas Group members, and Joe is going to ask them some very, very tough questions on giving, the things that we've always wanted to ask them ourselves. Thank you so much, Jim. Yeah, if our panelists could come up right now, we have Bob, Rich, and Trish. Hey, folks, let's welcome them as they come up, too. Yeah, so these are tough questions about generosity. What are tough questions? Well, generosity always has sort of a mystery about it, right? Even as we grow in our generosity and in our journey towards greater stewardship, there's kind of this mysterious thing of kind of what's, what are other people doing? Uh, there's all these questions that we probably wouldn't ask. And so we have these brave individuals, these fellow Barnabas group members on stage, and they're going to share answers to some of those questions. Now, it's not just for entertainment value. That's not what we're here for. What we're here for is we want for you to take a big, bold step in whatever journey towards greater generosity you personally have. So you're going to hear a bunch of great stories, um, some new ideas, hopefully. Uh, I think our first step is probably to just have our, our uh, panelists introduce themselves. Bob, maybe you can start. Good morning. Well, my wife Susan and I have been members of the Barnabas Group. I think this is our seventh year, and I like to tell everybody this is one of the funnest things we do. We just love this group. Made some great friendships. Uh, we've been married for 15 years as of this month, blended family, um, and uh, just have a great time here. I'm an author and a life coach and a speaker. It's what I do. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, and um, so just glad to be up here this morning. Great. Good morning, my name is Trish Van Murek, and I'm just getting over a cold and laryngitis, so forgive mm. me in advance for the scratchy voice. Um, my husband Mark and I have been part of the Barnabas Group since about the beginning. Mark graduated in the first uh, master's program class in 1999, so we've been on the journey with the Barnabas Group and Convene and master's program since then. Uh, Mark and I um, uh, are oversee the Optimist Foundation, which I am the director of. I'll talk a little bit about that and how it's formed in a little bit. Um, but we have been uh, married 35 years, have adult children, and it was the grandbabies that gave me this cold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rich Cradle, and I have a cold too. And I don't know which grandbaby, but it was one of them. Um, uh, Rich Cradle, um, I'm the CFO of the James Stamps Foundation in Santa Ana. Uh, James Stamps was the first mayor of Downey, California in 1956, and a farmer who owned a lot of land and water, and that's the basis for our foundation uh, 52 years ago, uh, long before I was involved. Um, we live in Newport. Uh, I have three kids and five grandkids, and um, I, yeah, we've just in, enjoyed, particularly enjoyed Barnabas um, and the relationships here and um, uh, some amazing giftedness in Southern California in Orange County that is expressed and shared here. So it's good to be here. Thank you, Rich. Well, our first question would be for Bob, actually. So if you want to pass the mic down there. I'm glad I don't have a cold yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> uh, Bob, uh, of course, you wrote this book. Yet. We've already heard about it a little bit. Um, God turned you and Susan's world upside down not too long ago, but what was kind of interesting is he kind of met you there. Can you tell us the quick story um, that, of course, is in the book? Tell us more about that. Sure, and uh, God has a way of doing that, right? Meeting us at uh, some of our worst moments in life, because that's where he allows us to go sometimes, because that's where we will seek him. And that's kind of where Susan and I found ourselves. But, not, um, but before that, um, we were living a life right, or so we thought. We were um, successful in our business worlds and you know, senior level managers and C-level executives in the publishing and advertising industries and we were conquering the world you know, in our early lives, in our first half, we like to say. And um, it was quite a ride. We were conquering the world, going for broke, and we just about got there. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, through what we now call kind of our perfect storm, um, Lots of things happened in our lives that, you know, some were of our own making and some were environmental that we couldn't control, like economies that were greater than us. But we found ourselves 
asking ourselves a question about um, what are we doing here? And what was that first half all about? And like Bob Shank and Steve Vesser said this morning, right, we had lots of potential in our careers and we were living that potential and being very successful at it. But were we passionate about advertising and publishing? No. Was there a kingdom purpose to it? No, definitely not in the media world. <laughs> and so we had to say, well, we want more of that. We want to have purpose in our life. We won't just want to have potential and great business results. We want to have significance. And so we had to ask ourselves, after a first half of keeping up with the Joneses, quite frankly, and this was Susan's question, brilliance, I think God gave it to her, and she asked, who are the Joneses anyway? And that's where the title of the book was born. And it was in that moment that God really met us and brought us to a point where we had to start to ask some really tough questions. Because you feel it this morning when the, the, you know, the ranch speaks and ADF speaks and Giving Children Hope speaks. Don't you feel that? I mean, there's something we want to do with that and about that, and we need to, and we weren't. And so God met us in that moment, and um, there just... I could tell you story after story of how we got there, and but uh, it's all in the book. Um, but how we got there and how we got from that point to where we are today, and it's really just a God story. And a wonderful story. I have read the book. Highly recommend it. Definitely, Bob. So, um, next question would be for Trish. Trish, we see a lot of ministries here, and let's just be honest, in our minds, we're kind of scoring ministries, ones that are good for us, also just kind of scoring them. You've actually put a framework around how to do that through the OptiVest Foundation. A lot of people here have not. This would be a good time to pull out your pens. And what are your criteria for scoring a good match with the OptiVest Foundation? Well, let me tell you first a little bit how the OptiVest Foundation is, is set up. Uh, unlike a lot of other traditional foundations which have a corpus and distribute from their earnings, the Optivist Foundation is funded from the three primary companies under the Optivist umbrella of companies. So we have a financial uh, services, we have a, a real estate arm, and an investment banking. And the a foundation is funded from 10% of the gross revenue of those firms. So uh, we are p really a pass-through. So we're, you know, the money comes in, the money goes out as God provides. And because we're in the financial business and evaluating financial deals with due diligence and using those practices, uh, Mark and I just were really feeling, how can we perhaps quantify that which we were feeling in our sweet spot of those three Ps you talked about, the passion, purpose, and the other one? Potential, Potential thank you. <laughs> and, you know, we were feeling what God was putting in our hearts and, and obvious in bringing consensus to Mark and me as to where we were funding and granting over the last years. But uh, we, we had established it as a family foundation first and then moved it into this Optivist Foundation. And I thought, is there a way we can possibly quantify that which we were feeling internally? And what we did was we, we took just a hard, long look and a, a long process in saying, what is God really calling? Uh, what is our calling? What is our sweet spot? What has God uniquely uh, given us in terms of strengths, in terms of passions, uh, life experiences, what makes our hearts uniquely sink and soar, what m have been our unique uh, trials and triumphs, all those things that have formed us um, that are leading us to our giving journey. Uh, because as I'm sure you all understand that when you are in your sweet spot for uh, your vocation or your, or your serving, I believe it's the same with your giving, that you're going to have uh, the most joy and probably the most effectiveness. So we, we got some paper together over several weeks and came up with this, these six. Now, I have to tell you, these are not, these are our six. This is just what God's put in our lives as we've gone through this uh, examination process. But what it's helped do is sort of give sort of these quantifying standards, and it helps us in determining levels of granting. So in a hierarchy of priority for us, these are the six items, I'll tell you. They, they come unpacked with a further definition, which I won't take time to do. Uh, if you want to talk about it later, I'm happy to. Um, and then we rate each of these six from one to five for each potential recipient ministry. And then we score them. And that gives us just kind of a quantitative curve on, hmm, are they hitting it on the things that are important to us, or are they not? And it's okay, because we've zoned into our sweet spot for giving, and it helps us to say um, yes in maybe a small amount, yes in a greater amount, or really it helps us to say no. So these are our six, again. 
Um, and I'll just say the, the, the topics, and again, they, they come unpacked. Uh, first and foremost, which has to score pretty much on a five, um, is the centrality of Christ. Second is the great commandment. Third is the great commission. Fourth is holistic. Fifth is collaboration. And six is sustainability. Trish, I was going to say, can you go through them? One, I see people writing them down. Oh, so, yeah. okay. I'll help you figure out your <laughs> six, but these are ours. But yeah. um, the centrality of Christ, pretty much Bob Shank talked about that. I mean, these are just, but um, we have a definition for that as well. Uh, great commandment, great commission, holistic, collaboration, and sustainability. In addition to that, we have some other um, sort of weighing measures in terms of where we are in terms of their budget. We don't have grants that are more than a certain percentage of an overall budget, or we are not participating if there are not a certain number of other donors involved. So we have some other measuring standards. Again, we allow God to move. You know, this is not so metrically uh, in concrete that we don't allow God to just tug our hearts and we respond that way as well. But it provides sort of a honing in grid for us that's, again, focused on who we are, who God's formed us to be, and where we believe God has placed us strategically to involve and give ourselves away. That's outstanding. That's super helpful for a lot of people here. I've bumped I so. into that through the foundation quite a few times of how do you figure that sort of thing out. So thank you. Next question is actually for Rich here. Um, Rich, of course, being in the big foundation world as well, you, uh, you're often evaluating different charities that are out there. Um, you're going through the kind of the standard normal, do they you know, pass the various check boxes? But when we met, I found that there's a unique, you, you told me about a unique tipping point that you really, it's kind of that sweet spot that you know if a ministry or a charity is going to be a good fit. Can you tell us a little more about that? <clears throat> Well, Joe, every organization needs a visionary leader, and there's lots of them here today and every Barnabas meeting. You meet some amazing visionary leaders um, that set vision and set the course for the organization. The leader also needs a team to carry out vision and plan. We spend a, lot of, a fair amount of time meeting and understanding the team, who, how they work, um, are they equipped for the task, um, trained, uh, are they well-led, um, where do they need help? So we, we, we really, we do a lot of site visits because we have the time to do site visits. Some of you don't. Um, but we can't invest in vision alone. We need a plan and people to carry it out. You don't hear the term project management too often in the ministry context. Every strategic project which genera generous friends have given sacrificially to deserves a qualified project manager. Now, he or she may go by another name, but it's someone that, that, that is in the trenches and is leading the work wherever it may be, whether it's um, uh, training pastors and leaders in Southeast Asia or uh, you know, directing a rescue mission in Los Angeles. They still, you still have pe these, these people that need to be gifted and called for that. And we look for them, and we like to meet them. Definitely. And Trish, I remember that you have some stories about that. Could you share some of the stories, good or bad, on that? Well, yeah, one of the stories that I think I share with you is that uh, in looking at ministries, um, you may start out with having vetted them, and it's, it's gone through your metrics, and uh, as Richard's saying, you, you've got that project manager. But uh, as you find out what's going on, um, it may have had what Peter Greer from Hope International calls some mission drift. And so I think it's important that we continue to, um, you know, find out what's going on. We, we had supported a, an orphanage in Southeast Asia, uh, building some billions. Am I answering the right question? Yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> I'm in a fog, sorry. And uh, this orphanage, we had supplied the funds to build one of the of buildings in, in what was a, a sort of a village community. And uh, they had Christian couple where the parents, you know, these uh, kids, and uh, sort of all their homes were built, and there was a Christian school out, outside of the community that the kids were to go to. And then after a while, um, you know, we were in touch with project managers and people on the ground, and they're no longer going to the Christian school that had been eliminated. And so um, as that had become eliminated, we found out, you know, we had to make decisions accordingly, which was according to us, and what we found uh, was important to us, we would not fund it any longer. So being in touch with those people on the ground, the project managers, um, it was really, really important. Definitely. Bob, the word legacy oftentimes makes you cringe. Tell us why. 
I don't think it's a word legacy. That makes me cringe. It's, it's how we use it, I think, lots of times. Um, and we use the word legacy, we often think about what happens after somebody dies. Right, we think about the estate they leave or the business they build or something like that. And we plan a lot for that. We'll put you know, estate attorneys on it and financial planners on it and all those sorts of things. And yet we don't often put enough of that same type of planning into our legacy as we're building it today. Because you talked about the Great Commission, and Bob Shank mentioned it as well. Right? Our great calling is to love God, love people, and make disciples. Well, how much work do we put into that? And I'm pretty convinced that our legacy isn't something that happens when we die. It's something that we begin today. And it's a living legacy. We think about a living trust because we want to protect our financial assets. What about a living legacy that protects our spiritual and family assets? And think about going about life like that. See, Susan and I got to a point to where we are living for a purpose, but we are defining our purpose. And what we've learned is we can't define our own purpose. We have to discover our purpose. We have to learn what it is that the Lord's called us to do uniquely and go do that. And we, had to, we lost ourselves in the world. And we had to discover who we were in Christ. And we had to discover why we're here. And then we had to go do something about it. And so today, we're just living about 180 degree life from where we were in our first half because we've discovered the answers to those questions. And it's just, it's absolutely liberating and exciting. So that's the thing about legacy that kind of just, uh, I just want to re redefine it, yeah. not get rid of it. When we met, you also had, you told me a story about moving your parents as well, and it kind of pertained to that. Can you tell us the quickly the story as well? Yeah, so my parents, you know, blessed to have both my parents living. They're 83 years old, and they're not, they're only four or five miles from where we live. But for 15 years, they lived out in the desert in the Palm Springs area. And, um, and they just got lonely out there. And they kept talking about wanting to move. And they kept talking about wanting to move and get closer to family. And I asked them a simple question. I said, well, you can do this when you have to, because one of you passes or health di dictates it, or you can do it when you want to. And they decided they wanted to do it when they wanted to, and they could make a difference in their kids' lives, and they do make a difference in our lives, and we could have relations with them. And I love the, how that ties into the living legacy idea, too, of, yeah, get on top of your living legacy while you can and you want to before you kind of, it's too late and it's the, the opportunity has gone by. Absolutely. Great. Um, Rich is, is our next question here. Rich, many of us are stubborn that, well, stubborn is probably a little bit strong of a word, uh, that giving should mostly go to overtly Christian organizations. I love your other story. Can you tell us why you can push back on that? Okay, I'm going to stick to my notes so I don't go over here, but um, this is mainly true in the international context for us. Um, we support a lot of Christian education, particularly colleges and seminary training. We like to support organizations with kingdom-minded leaders of influence, people serving in difficult environments. Foreman Christian College in Lahore, Pakistan, was founded in the 1860s by American Presbyterian missionaries. Everything changed for Christian institutions after Indian independence in 1948, when Pakistan became the official Muslim state of the subcontinent. FC College has over 5,000 undergraduate students, mostly Muslim, and over 50% of faculty are Muslim. These are not the radical type, although the radical elements are all throughout that country. The principal, the president, they call them principals over there, and a number of key faculty are believers and are there serving in a very tenuous country with full support of the government. The president is a career intervarsity leader who actually ran two Urbana missionary conferences before returning to Pakistan to lead Foreman five years ago. I did say returned. He also happened to grow up as a missionary kid in Pakistan and speaks fluent Urdu. There are no Biolas, no Wheatons, and no vanguards in Pakistan, and likely will not be. But there are a handful of fully devoted followers of Christ teaching Pakistani college students in an old Christian college that has survived by God's grace. The president, Jim, is one of the leading Christian educators serving in the Muslim world today. He'll be here in March if any of you would like to meet him. 
great, and it just shows how God can work through those sorts of things. Trish, you'll be our last question here, but of course a lot of us are wondering, you've done a great job um, kind of blurring the lines between business, ministry, through OptiVest, the OptiVest Foundation, you and Mark personally. Can you tell us a little bit about the dynamics of how do you do that in a workplace? Well, we created the foundation as the Optimist Foundation for uh, several reasons, one of which was, as I explained, to maximize kingdom giving uh, from our funding process, but also to provide an integrated environment um, of exposure, first for our clients, so that they would uh, have a chance to see kingdom principles actually at work and introduce them and, and involve them and invite them in them. And then also for our employees. Um, we often will scholarship our employees on short-term mission trips, uh, provide support to things that they're passionate about. We've got weekly Bible studies going on on campus with our 22 staff. Uh, and starting next month, we're going to be involving the 200-plus employees that are around the country in an online giving platform so that they will have a chance to direct a portion of foundation funds uh, to our pre-vetted ministries so they can have a hands-on experience. Again, the whole idea is integration for us. Um, so many uh, ministries are trying to adopt business best practices, and we as a business are trying to adopt ministry practices um, because we really believe that um, that's what Christ would want us. This is an integrated experience. It's worship. And so we are trying to run our business more and more like a ministry at its core and really transform you know, hearts and lives. It's not just about, and ironically, we're in the investment business where you're looking at bottom line and ROI and all those things, but we're trying to shift the paradigm and give them a kingdom look at really what's the greatest return. And um, it's been challenging, but actually um, really an incredible opportunity. We've had non-believers go on us uh, with trips and um, nothing but really positive feedback from those outside of our staff and in the marketplace that we interact with. That's outstanding. And one thing, please feel welcome to talk with any of our panelists and ask these sorts of tough questions of them. And I know there are many others in the room who are willing to share these ideas. If we never sh communicate these ideas, I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of other companies out there that could be using this sort of a model. And uh, they'd be definitely looking to you, Trish, to know, okay, how do we actually do that? And so that could be a, one of the uh, many different big, bold steps in generosity for some people that are here today. Um, another big step, a, a lot of us are trying to figure out, okay, what's God calling me to even do? Um, coming up, I think it's March 10 and 11, starting in the afternoon of the 10th through the 11th, uh, there will be one of those generous giving journeys of generosity. If you have never taken a look at that, it's just a wonderful experience for be making sense of what God has kind of put into your hands. Um, it's uh, overtly no ask, so I think that you would be very pleased. It'll be down in Dana Point. That's another step that you can take. If you're looking for other steps to take as well, um, of course, there's all kinds of tools, techniques, and whatnot, and that's kind of my NCF world, but I, I'd be jumping the gun. It's, it's kind of preparing our hearts first. But if you would like to know about some of those other partners, um, organizations that aren't necessarily an end user type of a ministry, but can really build you up in a certain way. So, for example, if you're a financial advisor, you need to know about kingdom advisors. Um, how do we speak to our clients as financial advisors um, about generosity as a, as a bigger piece of what they're doing in life in general? Well, Kingdom Advisors is wonderful for that. Um, Kingdom Advisors contact and whatnot is in this book. It's over on this table. Um, but most importantly, let's give our panelists another uh, round of applause for being so open.